May it please the court, counsel. My name is John Frost. I have the privilege of representing Rebecca Ann Thompson, who is the personal representative of her husband's estate, which is Joshua Thompson. Um, the facts are that uh, Joshua Thompson was killed in an automobile motorcycle accident in 2006. At the time, John Tingler was the driver of the vehicle that struck Mr. Thompson. The Thompson, the uh, Tinglers had had their insurance with the Doug Bishop Agency since 1988. They had been insured with him, shared all their automobiles. Uh, they even had a uh, rental policy. They had some other policies with the Doug Bishop Agency. In 1988, they had applied for an umbrella policy. At that time, their children were very young. The date of birth, uh, one child was 1984, the other child was 1986. The issue here is the umbrella policy and whether or not there was coverage under that policy at the time of the accident in 2006. Now, they had had an umbrella policy for years, since 1988. The year prior to the 1988, or year prior to the renewal in 2004, their policy looked like this. It said, a million dollars coverage, three autos, two automobile operators. Even though at that time in 2004, they would have had a youthful operator. And even though Doug Bishop Agency knew they owned more than three automobiles. But this was 2003 to 2004. In August, um, Mrs. Tinger was asked to sign a driver endorsement exclusion because uh, John Tingler had had some problems that were not driver related and his license was suspended for six months. In November of this next year, 2004, it would be reinstated and was reinstated. So they got this um, renewal certificate in 2004 um, that looked like this. This, for the first time, says now six autos, three automobile operators, one youthful operator. The contention is that we believe that this policy has, and this is clearly under 627.402, part of the insurance policy. This is all they got in the mail is this sheet. She says she got nothing else attached. She says she didn't see the driver endorsement form that she had signed. She signed it in blank. Uh, until the litigation. She didn't see it completed. She got this policy, and this is what she got. Has the driver exclusion endorsement. This is the reference to that. This side, we contend, is that this whole part of the policy is ambiguous. And we believe that two judges have agreed that it's ambiguous, and I would t read to you the comments by Judge Jacobson at the first first hearing. And he said what throws the curve in here is the inclusion of the certificate as part of the policy because I have to confess, looking at that renewal certificate, that right there, uh, it is ambiguous. His words. I mean, I have to say that the renewal certificate is ambiguous and that has been reinforced by apparently the deposition of this. The attorney for State Farm then argued, this is State Farm attorney, there's also no requirement, there's another issue that's going to come up, there's no requirement the youthful operator be defined. It is not defined anywhere. He goes on to say youthful operator is a rating function, so the idea that somehow calling someone a youthful operator creates in the trial court. Judge Jacobson, I disagree entirely. I'll cut you right off. I don't know if your youthful operator means someone under 24, someone under 21, someone under 18, it says youthful operator, you choose the language, you're stuck with the language. Let me just say right now, going further, whether, you, whether your argument, I find that confusing. Whatever your argument, I find that confusing. I find that ambiguous, referring to this policy. 
Whether or not that legally binds them in any way is a different question, but on the face, that's ambiguous. This is the same, this is the 2005, 2006 renewal that they got the next year. Again, same stuff. Six autos, three automobile operators, one youthful operator. At the time of this policy, Cheryl, the daughter, would have been 21 years old, and John, the son, would have been 19. Who's the youthful operator? How many drivers is there? Their own State Farm agent or State Farm employee said, change two times. One, she said, well, I think we're ready for three drivers and one youthful operator. And she later said, no, I think we're ready for a total of three, one of which is youthful. Ambiguous to her, completely ambiguous. We believe in, I'd like to reserve five minutes. I'm sorry, I didn't tell you. No, that's fine. Thank you. Um, we believe the law is very clear that if that policy is ambiguous, which two judges have said it was, and what Judge Jacobson said to try and get by this was he said, okay, the left side of this policy is, the left side of this is part of the policy. The right side, which is ambiguous, that's not part of the policy, that's a rating. Now you tell me that in today's society, somebody do a, a layman, and the law is that the policy should be written so that the average man can understand it. You tell me that the average man can understand that that means this side doesn't apply, that side does apply. And I would submit that we believe with the finding that this is ambiguous and the case law, and um, let me also tell you what Judge Hunter said about this, because he heard it, he was the second judge to hear this. Well, I give you as a finding of fact that the right side of the document is confusing. It's confusing to me, and I think I have more knowledge than the average person does about this kind of thing. It's obvi obviously was even confusing to State Farm because they came up with several interpretations. What the, what the question is on the right side of this, when it says three people plus one youthful driver, and I talked about this the other day, and State Farm could have been more articulate about this, and there's no question about it, and we probably wouldn't be here today. They could have said three operators, one youthful, and said who the youthful operator was. Or they could have said who the other operators were. But they didn't. They didn't make it plain. They didn't make it understanding. So it's quite reasonable to suspect that Mrs. Taylor, when she got this, knowing that John's license is, and he can now drive again, that he's insured under here as a youthful operator. He's the youngest one in the house. The other daughter had moved to college, or had moved out, had her own place. Um, but as we go on and look at the law that should apply, and the law says basically that uh, counsel says, well, let's go to Mitchell, says insurance policy in general and exclusions in particular are interpreted strictly against the carrier. Uh, in prudential property, any ambiguity in an insurance contract, quote, must be interpreted liberally in favor of insured and strictly against insurer who prepared the policy. That's what Judge Hunter was saying. It's been simple to put who this person was, who these people were, but they didn't do that. Third, if we look at uh, Trevino, exclusionary clauses in insurance policies, and in that case it was a driver exclusion, such as a dr driver exclusion endorsement, are issued in this matter are construed even more strictly than coverage clauses because you're excluding somebody. Remember this was signed in 2004 and all she gets, all they get is insurance is they get this. They don't get the endorsement back. They don't get the endorsement every year after that. They don't ever get the endorsement. They get a little reference that they're supposed to know and interpret this to mean this, to mean that that driver exclusion is still in existence even though John has a driver's license and John is is can drive in the state of Florida. And, and we look at Stewart Petroleum, if endorsements and policies are ambiguous, 
the clause affording greater coverage prevails. And in this case, if you interpret this to mean that John is a, is a driver here, then that provides coverage because it conflicts with exclusion over here. They don't, you can't, if you can read this and say, who is insured under this policy, this certificate, um, you're better than I am because I, can't, I cannot figure it out and nobody else, and, and as we litigated this, State Farm had trouble figuring it out. Uh, everybody else had trouble figuring it out. So we would submit that clearly there's an ambiguity because this is under 40, uh, 607.402, this is the policy. This is part of the policy. And you gotta take all of this. You can't just take the left side versus the right side. This is the policy. And we believe that this policy interpretation under this side to show that John's covered. This side, John's not covered. There's an ambiguity here and you have to construe it and have to interpret it against the insurance company because they're the ones who drafted this. They could have, it could have been simple. It could have been clear. They didn't do that. So we would submit to you that uh, under the, the cases that the trial judge was wrong, summary judgment should not have been get granted, summary judgment should have been granted for us, and that it should have found that there was coverage under this umbrella policy, and that therefore um, we would ask it to be remanded with the court to find, the trial court to find that there is coverage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please the court, Mark Tinker on behalf of State Farm. Uh, I think the key to this case is that there are actually two different counts that were pled below. There was the straightforward declaratory judgment count, which is what does the insurance policy say? Is it unambiguous? Does it have an exclusion in it? The second part is a lot of what's been commingled in as far as the argument is what was Ms. Tingler led to believe with, through her conversations with the insurance agent that if uh, John got his license back, that he was going to be put back on the policy, that that endorsement was going to be removed. That issue was not subject to summary judgment, and that's not been made part of this appeal. Uh, that issue went to trial, actually went to trial twice, and two different juries ruled against Ms. Tingler, said, no, you weren't misled. You knew what this endorsement was. You admit that you saw it. You admit that you signed it. You were told because uh, John has an issue with his license, he's not going to be uncovered under the policy and nothing changed from the time that she signed that endorsement forward. The premium didn't change, uh, never received notice that the exclusion was gone, and even as uh, counsel points out, it's on the, on the renewal form every time. It says driver exclusion endorsement, it's right there. So she was not misled, two juries have rejected that, and that's not part of the appeal. What is part of the appeal is what both judges considered and what they both ruled. They said that endorsement is unambiguous, it says, there is no coverage if John Tingler is operating a motor vehicle. This accident was the result of John Tingler operating a motor vehicle. Uh, whatever the ratings information and how he was included as an insured for other parts of the policy, that's one thing important to remember. This isn't an auto policy. It's an all-risk policy. So he is an insured under the policy. He is covered if he accidentally slams somebody's hand in a door, if he hits a baseball through somebody's window. He's insured. There's no coverage if the accident involves him driving an automobile. Both judges looked at that. They said the endorsement's unambiguous. Uh, unless the court has any specific questions, I think it's uh, pretty much that cut and dry. It's look at the endorsement. What does it say? Under established law, endorsements control over anything to the contrary that might be in the policy. Thank you. Thank you. As I said in my initial argument, there was no argument about the second part. There was another case, but you got to remember that in that case, the burden of proof in that case is clear and convincing evidence, not the greater weight of the evidence. And the only question that they were asking that was whether or not there was a telephone conversation between Mrs. Tingler and um, the State Farm Agency regarding whether John would be reinstated. That's the only question the jury asked, and that, that was, had to be proven by clear and convincing evidence. To say that nobody found this ambiguous is, is totally wrong, because if we even look at the uh, Judge Jacobson's order, 
He says, the court finds that the arguably confusing language under automobile exposure does not in any way change the terms of the clearly set forth personal injury umbrella policy in terms of the driver exclusion endorsement. What he said was, and he's the one who made the distinction, left side is policy, that's what he found, and right side is not policy. But he found that the right side was confusing. And I just read to you his comments that he found, and Judge Hunter found specifically that it was confusing and it was ambiguous. You heard no argument here except to say the court didn't find it. The courts did find that, and they had to work a way around this being the total part of the policy. Because if this is confusing, if this is ambiguous, then we should win. And that's what happened. We got to the part where the Judge Jacobson had said, okay, what do I do now that I've found this? And I said, well, the case law says if you find the policy ambiguous, you have to rule in my client's favor. And that's when he said, well, let me think. Okay, no, what I'm finding is the left side of this is part of the policy, and the right side is not part of the policy. And that way I get around the ambiguous part because the left side, he says, is not ambiguous. You can't do that. This is a policy. This is part of the policy. No layman knows that that whole document there is not part of their insurance policy. And when you look at it, you cannot tell who's insured under this policy. You can't tell. Or you can tell it on one side and you can't tell it on the other side. Either way, it's ambiguous. How else can you say that that's an unambiguous policy? It is. There's no other way to say it. And both judges commented on it and tried to get around it. Judge Hunter said, finally made the conclusion, well, the exclusion prevails over any other part of the policy. Well, that's not the law. The law is the exclusion applies if it's not ambiguous or does not, as part of the whole policy, does not make the whole thing ambiguous. And then in that case, which he didn't take the next step, it says that in that case you have to find for greater coverage. And that's where the greater coverage issue comes in. But there's no logical argument that anybody's made that the counsel on the other side hadn't made it. They never made it to say that this part of the policy is confusing as to who is insured. And if it's confusing as to who is insured, it's ambiguous. And if it's ambiguous, the case law is clear. You've got to construe it against the insured. And the insurer, I'm sorry. And that's exactly where we are here today. And you have to grant it as it relates to where the greatest coverage is. And the greatest coverage would apply that the policy applies. And it should apply. And so I beat that horse as much as I can. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our next case this morning, Mr. Marshall, Mr. Hall, Mr. Hayward.